the podcast. Uh, our in-studio guest today is Mr. John Miller. Good to see you, John. Glad you came by for the Thank podcast. You. Appreciate you being here, my friend. Very pleased to be here. All right. Um, you know, I'd like to thank you for coming and taking your time because I personally feel like that people's stories are important, and especially the things that we do with music and how we kind of walk in this life. And hearing everybody's story, it gives people an opportunity to think about where they're at, where, what they would like to do. Because my, my, the long-range goals are is we hope to find, uh, I call them diamonds. You, you, you have a diamond, right? And you share that diamond with people and so people can learn from you and, and others in that. So uh, this is about, uh, you know, this industry we talk about is the homespun, homegrown uh, music scene. It's not, it's not just something that's in our general area. It's all worldwide. Everybody, you know, there's a lot of indie musicians. There's a lot of people that, you know, they make their living or this is their hobby or whatever it is, but they do spend time in this. So uh, that's what we're here to do today is talk about that. You know, a uh, couple of quick announcements. You know, these, these things that we're talking about, you know, they're, they're not uh, written in stone. Everybody's, you know, experiences, you know, what they say, your mileage may vary. So uh, listen, to, listen to the stories and, and think about what, uh, like I said, where they've been and what they've done, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. All right, well, uh, unless you've got some special information or something you want to share with us, uh, I'll get right into the questions. Yeah, let's dive in. Let's dive in. All right, well, I, I like a man who wants to get right, get right <laughs> into it. Okay. Well, John, um, first question is, well, you know, how and when did you start? Where, you know, how long have you been in this uh, industry? Uh, I've been playing now for almost 50 years. 50 I've, years. I've been performing. Um, started um, as a teenager in high school. Right. And uh, my, uh, going back a little further than that, we've always had music in our house. Right. Uh, right. My uh, father was uh, into Dixieland and blues and jazz, and my mother was more of a uh, classical kind of a musician so i had a, a pretty broad background uh, to draw from okay um about the time i was eight years old my parents signed me up for guitar lessons and it lasted about a month <laughs> i had you know an attention span about right that right long. you said I you had, was eight i was eight okay well yeah, yeah. <laughs> i had uh, had the coolest guitar it had uh, cowboys and cactuses and oh yeah right ropes on it and a uh, little <laughs> nylon string six string right right and uh, had that braided rope for for the yep uh, braided <laughs> rope for the for the the, uh, um, the strap right right, yeah. right. so uh, I went through that but uh, by the time I got into high school um, I actually picked up guitar to impress girls uh, and I'm sure nobody has ever done that before <laughs> yeah real original <laughs> thought huh. <laughs> Um, again, we, we always had music in our house and, uh, my mother, uh, was, uh, very supportive of pop music at the time. This is in the sixties and, uh, well, actually the late seventies by this time. And, uh, you know, she would buy uh, some of the latest albums and I'd listen to them and, you know, try to, um, uh, copy what they were doing on, uh, so you was listening to country ma mainly back then no, or Dixieland? Mostly, or? mostly it was, uh, uh. Rock and roll. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was rock and roll coming up. Uh, okay. And uh, pop music. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was my early influence. Um, started listening to uh, some of the rock bands that were uh, big in the days, you know, the Beatles, the Stones, uh, Creedence Clearwater, uh, that kind of music. That was good music, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was. So anyway, I tried to, tried to uh, copy what they were doing on a little guitar in the basement and you know, fell into a couple of guys that had the same interests that uh, I had. Wow. And uh, so uh, we put together uh, kind of a, we had a trio, an acoustic trio. Okay. And uh, spent a lot of time, uh, you know, playing all the, the high school uh, functions. Uh, did the, the and the girls were paying attention. Uh, a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> a few of them noticed. So, you know, I can't complain, uh, right. you know, in, in that direction. Right. But um, then, uh, you know, life got in the way. Um, Boy, doesn't it? I played through high school and college and uh, got out of college, got married, had a mortgage, uh, had a house. That'll learn you, darn you. <laughs> and, uh, I thought I was never going to play guitar again. Oh. Sold all my equipment. Kept one guitar, um, and 
and for 20 years um, didn't uh, didn't touch an instrument. Huh. Then when my youngest turned 11, her aunt from Nashville sent her a guitar. And uh, I had the one guitar left under the bed. I uh, drug it out from under the bed and taught her what I knew. Right, right. My daughter, Kat, uh, she's a performer in uh, Bryant College Station. Okay. And she is better than I will ever be <laughs> right now. But uh, she picked it up, and it got me back into it. This uh, was probably around uh, 2005. Oh, cool. And uh, so, I, you know, I drug this one guitar out, and I said, well, you know, hey, this feels pretty good. And uh, woke, woke, woke something back up, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it woke up all this that I'd been I'd been missing. You know, I spent uh, thirty years in the in the corporate world, and uh, you know this this kind of brought me back to what I really really love. And uh, so, um, started buying guitars again. And <laughs> much to the chagrin, <laughs> yeah, much to the chagrin. <laughs> and uh, uh, started. I, I I would carry a guitar every place I went. Right. Uh, Right. I take it to business meetings. I take it to, uh, you know, outings. I would just take it places, and uh, when there was nothing going on, I'd sit and play. It, it's funny how, and, and I know what you're saying here because, I, like you know, I've said in some of the other podcasts, you know, all our all of our stories are familiar, but not exactly the same. But for guys like yourself, myself, others, it's funny how something that is an inanimate object takes on a life of being somewhat of a friend. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I get does. I get what you say in there. So. Absolutely does. So anyway, I'd be I'd be sitting around. I'd play in parks, I'd play at uh, you know, restaurants, at any place they'd basically let me. And I uh, started um, communicating with other artists in the area. And uh, we put together a collaboration. We uh, put together an old folks rock band. <laughs> right, well, hold hold, on, hold that thought because I want I want to ask you a few other questions because I do want to get down to collaboration. But um, and so you've told me uh, how long you've been in business. You've told me what's really, really kind of influenced you. I heard it from your family, which, which is, happens to a lot of folks. So, um, who do you know that you would speak out to or or talk about that? Or, and you know, I try to keep this thing somewhat local, regional. Maybe is probably a better way to say this. But who do you know and inf really influences what we do? Um, you know, this can be anything from business yeah. owners or, or other musicians or other people that you're associated with. Who do you feel like just really takes that next well, step? Well, I mentioned my in-laws in, uh, in Nashville. Okay. Uh, my brother-in-law, uh, Jim Aylward, owns a publishing company in Music Row. Oh. And uh, he's got a stable of uh, songwriters that work for him. And through Jim, I met uh, Chris Gantry. Now, Chris Gantry is a... One of the original Nashville uh, outlaws. He was a wingman <laughs> of Chris Christopherson in the 70s. He uh, hung out with the likes of Johnny Cash. Um, he wrote uh, Dreams of the Everyday Housewife for Glenn Campbell. Hmm. Uh, he's written for Cash. He's written for Dolly Parton. Um, and uh, I got to say that uh, uh, listening to his stories, right. his, you know, what he's, what he's gone through in his life, uh, has just been a huge influence, and he has had an influence on the industry well, in general. That's 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 one of those diamonds I'm talking about because you know not everybody has the same connections, of course. But but to know how these you know how these things are associated, that's and what was and because I'll research him. What was his name? Uh, Chris Gantry. Chris Gantry. But your brother-in-law's name was Jim Aylward. J Jim Aylward. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll look him up. Cool, cool vibes music. Good. All right. Well, we'll we'll do that. Well, thank you for that. Oh, uh, so what do you feel like is your contribution to this? That you know, this what part do you play in all of this? And uh, I know you can. I've, I've kind of seen you out performing and things, but what part do you feel like you play in all? My, of this? my contribution right now is I host an open mic every Friday. Cork this tap that in right. uh, Dobbin, Texas. Okay, and uh, what it does is it provides a venue uh, for up and coming artists. It's a non judgmental venue. Right. Uh, we get a lot of folks out there that have never been on stage before. We encourage them to get up. We encourage them to get up and perform their own music, uh, play what they're comfortable with. And I've been gratified to see several of them go on, um, and now they've actually built, their, their, they're starting their careers in this business, getting gigs on their own. In fact, we've got one fellow that uh, has been a songwriter for probably 
20, 30 years, never, ever performed on stage until he came out one night. Uh, I met him in uh, Old Magnolia, bought a guitar from him. Okay. He happened to mention he was a songwriter. I says, great, where do you play? He says, well, I really don't really know. <laughs> Good. So I says, well, why don't you come out to the open mic? We'll set you up on stage, and you know, we'll give you an audience. And uh, this guy got hooked, and uh, he's one of our um, old-timers now. Huh. Yeah, his name is uh, Garland Jones. Out of Garland Ohio. Jones. I, I think I've met Garland. Yeah, you probably met Garland. Uh, I think I've met Garland. Wonderful old gentleman. Well, you know, that's... That, that's a worthwhile endeavor. You know, if you've been around doing this for any kind of time, you, you know, things have done a lot of changing in this industry, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But, you know, uh, there used to be Opry houses and, you know, prevalent, and you could go play at those. And you could find a few open mics, but the people weren't weren't really willing to share the mic. You know, they, they had their opportunity to get it, and, and that's what they did. So, I, I do know that in the past few years at the open mic, it really has opened up a lot of platforms. So thank you for the effort that you put out because you know, I know it's work, you know, being part of that and doing part of that in my time too. Uh, but taking that and it comes, if I, if I can speak to this, do, running an open mic, putting an open mic together, making sure everything, you know, everybody's getting to where they need to be and things are happening the way they should. It, it comes out of out of consideration and care for the other person, and that's 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 an important part of this. So. Yeah, it's all about giving them a showcase. There you go. All right, well, thank you for that answer. That's a great answer. Uh, I know it's yours, but it was a great answer. Okay, so now we're back into the collaboration. You you were you were taking off on me there. I kind of pull you back just a little bit, but so I I asked this question about collaboration because. You know, being the fact that there's so many different ways to collaborate, you know, you can collaborate with a band, you can collaborate with uh, songwriters, you can, like you're having to collaborate with a, uh, a venue in order for this open mic. So, it, of course, the obvious question, our answer is yes, you do collaborate. But give me your thoughts on collaboration. Where do you see that? Well, I tell you what, collaboration is the best way to learn. Um, I certainly don't know everything about this business. I, you know, I hardly know anything about this business, but there are other people that do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, working with other artists, working with, uh, um, working with the producers, working with the, uh, the sound guys, um, that's the chance you have to really, really learn and get, find out what they're all about. Right. You know, what are their challenges? What are their opportunities? Um, what are they good at? Right, right. How can you help me be better? Right, you know right. that kind of a thing. So uh, I am, I am open to collaboration whenever I can. Well, you know, the, you, let's you take uh, somebody that's just now starting out in this business, or starting out in this industry, or has an idea that they would like to do some of, of you know, this music playing and going to these venues and things. Listen, you know, to collaborate with somebody is like you say is to learn. And that's, that's sometimes that's a hard thing to put up front, but you probably should because if you're going to get out there, you know, collaborating is asking questions and, and being there and taking people's, you know, lead on stuff like that. So, and some, but some people are not willing to, you know, they just, they want to do their thing and, and that's okay. And, and just, just who you are and what's your thoughts on it. So thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, uh, the next question is, uh, now this is one of those, uh, you, it, John gets to tell us something. Uh, you can have, you can either tell us about your biggest success or you can tell us about maybe, we, we, I don't really like the word failure, but let's say the biggest missed opportunity that, that you would have had. And it doesn't matter to me. Which one do you feel like is, is a t story to tell? I'm going to talk about one of the biggest rushes I got. Um, the biggest what? Rush. Rush, okay. That, that I got. Okay. Uh, and it, it was, uh, uh, it meant a lot to me. Uh, I played a rhythm and blues band and have for about uh, 15 years now. And we were playing on a cruise ship. We did three shows on a ship. We did, oh, but that was uh, fun. Oh, it was a riot. We played uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on the cruise ship. On Friday, we were off Miami, and they helicoptered the original drifters onto the boat. Now, <coughs> we're playing rhythm and blues, and that's what the, the, the drifters uh, really pioneered. Right. We got to sit in and play with the drifters that Friday night on this cruise ship, and it was <laughs> an absolutely <laughs> magical experience to, to, to be able to you know sit with guys that created this music. Right. 
Uh, right. So yeah, that was a that was a high point. That's of my that's career. a cool that's a cool story. That's a cool one. All right. So you gonna call that your biggest success? I'll call that a success. All right. Yeah, that was a big yeah, I, win. I, that's what I would take it as. That's a big win. <laughs> All right. Well, in the, kind of in the same vein, uh, what's your funniest or your saddest story? One that uh, that, that really speaks to your heart. Uh, the one that comes to mind is uh, I was playing with the same rhythm and blues band. We were playing in Mount Brook, and, and uh, you know, this was probably five years ago. Okay. And, uh, I'm in my 60s. Right. And uh, this uh, woman my age comes up to me, and I'm sitting at this, uh, at this table uh, between sets, and she goes, are you in the band? And I says, yeah. She goes, why? She goes, can I have your autograph? And she pulls her blouse open and it's to the side <laughs> of her chest. So this is a woman in her 60s. And, uh, you know, it's a, sure. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we had a good laugh over that. Okay, I'm trying to figure out, is that a sad story? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's probably the funniest thing. Okay, that's, we're, go, we're we going with a, funniest. We got a good laugh out of that. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll take that, buddy. I'll take that. <laughs> all right, so, uh, you know, this business that we're in, I, I did uh, mention that it has changed quite a bit over time. And and I'm, this next question that I'm going to ask you, it's it's not a it's not a name thing, it's not a, you know a venue or nothing like that. It, this is one of those questions. It's like I, I just wish it could be different, or I wish that you know things didn't work out that way, or I uh, you fill in the blank. But what upsets you the most about what we do or things? That if I and I, I told one of my guys the other day. Uh, you know, if I'm, I'm going to put the king hat on you right now, okay, so you're the king for the day, what changes are you going to make? What upset you and what changes would you make? Well, I, I got to tell you, um, when COVID hit okay, uh, and the fact that uh, all the venues shut down, people right. stopped going out, uh, and what I do basically dried up. Um, I had, had no venues to go to. Had right, to go. right, right, right. Um, we had to rethink everything that we were doing at the time just to stay active. And uh, thank goodness that there was this thing called the Internet. So uh, we started making uh, basically basement tapes and videos and uh, were able to get get out there. But, uh, you know, it, it took so long for the venues, even after they reopened, to come back online mm-hmm. and, you know, bring music back. It's still a little frustrating because I think, uh, you know, everybody's a little bit hesitant about, well, you know, do I want to hire this band or not? Right. Um, you know, are they going to bring in enough revenue to make it worthwhile? Um, so, you know, it, it, it kind of took, even though we were only shut down for maybe a year, year and a half, it probably knocked five years out of the out of the industry. Uh, yes. Yes, exactly. I, the, the We're going to call it residuals, yeah. the residuals from that. I'm, I'm totally with you on that, buddy. Uh, you you can feel it out there. I mean, even even from that person that would have normally just you know possibly just jumped in the in the vehicle and you know and on a, on a fluke and just run up there and have a good time meal or good time. That's not even you know. Yeah. So yeah, it it it, it has l- limited. Yes, it it's changed the mindset. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Well, ho- hopefully we can get past all that. Matter. <laughs> Seems like we're trying to. So. Okay, well, that's good. Good question. I mean, good answer. I'm sorry. Um, so I talk about organizations a little bit. Now, depending upon where you're at or what you've been doing, uh, you will be driven to different organizations, whether you're a songwriter and you're using BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, uh, whether you're a performer and, you know, you're wanting to network, being with, like, you know, Texas Country Music Associations, uh, of course, I, I, I don't have enough time in the day to announce uh, all the associations, but what uh, are there any organizations or associations that, that you're tied to that, that you like to use or, or do you like to give a shout out? Or, uh, or You know, it, regarding the business organizations, um, at my low level that I perform at, I, I don't really associate with any of them. Okay. Uh, I do have a wonderful network of uh, friends and uh, uh, venue owners uh, that uh, they're all independent that uh, I rely on. But uh, for an, an umbrella organization, I just really don't have one that I can fall back on. Okay. That's, that, 
you know, like I said, these some of these stories are familiar. Some of them are common thread, and and that's fine. It just like if if you're if you're into songwriting, well then then there's discussions around you know one of the you know clearinghouses, BMI, or like I said, and things of that nature. Uh, fair enough. Uh, so let me get on to here. How about business or vendor interactions? And I call this cutting through the fog. Now, once again, this depends on your walk, but recording, publishing, agencies, management, uh, business ventures with owner groups. I mean, what what do you feel like really works for you in this? Cutting, cutting through the fog is a very, very good term to use to that because it requires persistence. Okay. Um, it uh, requires you being the driving force uh, to get a lot of things done. Uh, with a lot of these uh, folks that you're dealing with, you're not the only pee on the plate. Right. So, um, you know, you've got to call them back and remind them and ask, how's it going? Hey, do you remember our conversation um, two weeks ago? Uh, are you still interested in that kind of thing? So, yeah, it's uh, – it really requires a lot of a lot of persistence, and you know you got to kind of have a backbone. And uh, when uh, somebody says no, um, okay, I understand. Right. What could I have done to make it better? Right. Or what could I have done to change your mind? So um, you know, don't uh, uh, don't take it personally. Take it professionally, and uh, but but just keep at it. Okay, that sounds like a good one. So, uh, and I know that uh, that you'll you'll be involved with a little bit of this, and and the uh, where do you stand with media or marketing strategy? Oh my gosh, it's all online now. Ooh, um, ain't it though? You know, um, you're lucky if somebody drives by and sees your name on a marquee, right? But uh, certainly, uh, all the marketing that is done is done online, and it's not a one shot deal. It's not putting your name out there. Good once. point. Good it, point. It's going out there and hitting a dozen different websites. And if you've got a show on Friday, you post it Monday, you post it Wednesday, and then again on Friday on a dozen websites just so people will see it. It takes almost 10 interactions on the Internet for it to yeah. register uh, once in a person's mind. Yes, that's I, – I, I personally have been, you know, walking through some things with this media and marketing strategies, and I spend a remarkable amount of my time trying to learn. And you are – everything you said is spot on. Uh, it's, it's almost have, like having to keep driving that nail. You, you just keep driving it, keep driving it, keep driving it because those days of the, of the marquee, you know, right. where we, where we had our name, when you right. drove down the road, we, you right. know, that doesn't hardly fly anymore. That's right. Uh, people, you know, they don't, they're, they're checking their phones and they're, and they're adding what your event to their calendar and, and, and doing their shopping list at the same time. The, the so. days of putting a poster up in the music store just aren't happening. <laughs> it don't anymore. happen, does it? Nope. Okay. Good enough. Good enough. So, uh, as I have mentioned, there's been a lot of changes in the industry. Where do you see things, in your own mind, where do you see things going? I mean, you know, let, let's talk, and I can kind of frame this up for you. You know, there, it was back in the old days where, you know, the, the syndicates, we'll call them, owned everything, uh, and, and, you know, whatever they said went. And now you've got the indie. Uh, I personally have some opinions about it, but I really kind of would like to know where does where do you see things going? I, I think there is a wonderful opportunity for more exposure for young artists. Again, based on the internet, right? Just based on what guy, what one guy and a camera and a recording system can do to put out there on his own. Now, uh, it may or may not get national attention, right? But it's a place to start. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to. Uh, sit on a uh, on a street corner anymore yeah. with your guitar case open just to get an audience. You can have a wonderful audience by going online uh, through venues like Facebook or Instagram. And, uh, you know, you've got a new song, you want to publish it, you want to get some opinions, or go ahead and put it out there. And um, you'll, get, uh, you'll get a lot of feedback, uh, both positive and negative, on what you think. It, 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 it's not necessarily at the whim of a corporation anymore. Yes, you right. have. I think you've got a bigger opportunity to drive it yourself. Well, you know, some of the things. I mean, I'll, I'll throw my two cents. And I sense what, you, what you've said there is, you know, before if you if you went to a venue and you paid for a venue, you had two choices: sit there and listen, or get up and walk out. Right. Well, in today's market, uh, they can surf until their little hearts, you know, have been surfed out. And they can pick and choose and add to playlist and do this and then and then walk away and, and then five days later be listen you know they've already have everything set up just exactly the way they want it so 
It's it's uh it's been a, been a very interesting chain of events. Well, let me tell you something else. You know, we're talking about what what technology can do for for a band. Uh, this rhythm and blues band that I'm in, um, uh, the uh, drummer lives in Boston. The keyboard player lives in Florida. The sax player lives in uh, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, the guitarist uh, lives in Huntsville. Uh, the lead singer lives in Bryan, Texas, and I live in College Station. You know how we practice? We do it online. Zoom? With a Zoom-type <laughs> application. This is made for music. It's called Jam Kazam. Jam Kazam. I've and never heard of that before. We play in real time, and we practice every Tuesday night for about two and a half hours, and uh, that's how we get our new material pulled together. All right, y'all caught that jam, Kazam. We need, we need to go check that out. Do, do a little surfing ourselves. Yeah. Well, thank you. Once again, a diamond. So, see, you've, you're, you're, you're teaching people right now, so very good for you. Um, I think we kind of touched based on this. We don't need to spend a lot of time, but do you see anything? Is there anything else that you would say that you feel like needs to change in, in this business? Or? Um, no, I, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy with uh, the comeback that we've had, uh, you know, so far after COVID. I just want to see more venues open up to having, uh, having live music. Um, the customers certainly love it. The people love it. Uh, whenever you can get live music, I think it adds a, a special piece to any venue that you have. I agree. I agree. So as a performer, uh, what do you feel like that you do works the best for you? What is it that, that you feel like is your, your go-to? Um, I've got a couple of things. Um, I, I play in, in, in several bands, and uh, I am kind of the glue that holds these guys together. Uh, I, I'll act as a mediator. Um, you've got uh, you know, some headstrong artists here and here and here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I like to work together with those guys to try and, you know, get a compromise um, on, on what we're going to do. Uh, as a solo artist, uh, right now I'm doing a lot of acoustic stuff. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, um, I've done primarily acoustic now for the last year and a half. Okay. And um, even when I do the duets, rather than playing electric uh, guitar, I've, I've switched to an acoustic I agree. guitar. I agree. Because um, I honestly feel like that there's been a, a little bit of a renaissance there with the acoustic. You know, it... It, it, we, we got into the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, right? And everything got hot and electrified. And okay, great. And it sounded great. Uh, but, you know, uh, maybe we can credit Bob Dylan or some of the others. But somewhere along the line, uh, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, the acoustic, you know, really, there's so much power, strength, love, and, and warmth in an acoustic performance. And, and if you're out there doing that, then you. I have to say, you're you're really putting it forward. So. Well, you know, plus you can take it any place. You yeah. know, you can sit on a park bench and play it. You don't have to worry about lugging an amp, looking for power or well, anything you, like that. You, you don't quite get away as much with, in my book, you don't get as much away with uh, stuff on acoustic because the, the stuff you're playing, I mean, you know, I have a few effects and things that I play with, but and that's to sweeten the, sweeten the tone that I already have. But uh, I love acoustic playing, so bless your heart on that. So what are your plans for the future, John? What uh, you just going to... Uh, well, you know, uh, I'm retired, right. and uh, I have been able to devote uh, more time to this than I ever have been able to in my life. And uh, hopefully I'm going to just keep keep doing what I'm doing, uh, you know, promoting uh, young artists and uh, uh, playing uh, uh, in, the, in the venues and in the bands that I'm doing. And I am just having the time of my life. Okay. So I don't plan to slow down. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um... Well, how about this? Uh, you kind of did, but describe your show. What are we going to see if we come see John playing tonight? At, well, uh, again, uh, tonight, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I'm doing an acoustic show at uh, Moe's Irish Pub in College Station. Right. Uh, when I do solo acts, I'll do, I'll do acoustic. Uh, occasionally, uh, I will uh, bring up uh, uh, you know, somebody out of the audience I know to, to join me in a duet. I do play in two other duets with uh, female vocalists. They're both keyboard players, so that's Pretty much uh, background music at restaurants and wineries. So you're and you're mainly doing cover songs there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's mu- music people know. Okay, okay. Um, All right. You know, people music people can relate to music people know. Okay. All right. Good enough. Good enough. So uh, if you want people to get in touch with you, I you I know like I said you're on the websites and, and things of that nature. But what's the best way to people to contact you if they want to open mic? You know, ran or or they want you to come perform or how can best, they do best that? Best way to get hold of me is yes, either either contact me through one of the band's websites, 
or uh, just email me direct at J-M-I-L-L-E-R-T-X at live, L-I-V-E, dot com. Okay. Is there any kind of Facebook pages or Yeah, we've got, uh, uh, they can, they can uh, look me up on uh, uh, JK and the Frets. JK and the Frets, JK okay. JK and the Frets okay. on Facebook, uh, the Fabulous 8 Tracks on Facebook, um, the uh, uh, Fabulous Brookwoods on Facebook. Okay. So those are all. Uh, you got a lot going on there, buddy. I've got a handful of projects <laughs> going on. Well, good. All right. Well, good enough. Oh, so, and I tell everybody the same thing. Uh, this is the most important question that I can ask somebody. What's your advice to anyone that would like to do this or be in this industry? Once again, don't be persistent and don't give up on your dream. Just be persistent. Uh, Hang you know, in there. Uh, I started this uh, journey 50 years ago. And uh, I am still learning. I'm still discovering new music. Um, I am having the time of my life. Just don't ever give up on it. Good advice, buddy. Good advice. Well, John, I want to thank you for being with us today. And uh, uh, I tell everybody the same thing, and, it, and I, but I mean it the same way. And it is that uh, I hope everybody around you understands how blessed they are to have you in their life. Thank you. So thank you for being who you are and what you're doing. It, it, Thank you. it goes a long way. The other thing, uh, a couple messages here, you know, I, I leave every podcast with a positive affirmation and that possibilities are endless. Your thoughts become your reality as we've been discussing here today. And don't worry about the things you can't control. Okay. Now, as in other comments and other uh, podcasts, I really don't put the like subscribe notification thing up front. Uh, but there are subscribe buttons, there are like buttons or notifications. Now, l- let me tell you why I think it's important that, that, that you listen to what I'm about to say. These people that I'm bringing in to this table and giving them the opportunity to tell their story, the best way that you can help them, not me, I'm not asking for me, I'm asking for them. The best way that you can do that is to share these stories like the video, subscribe to the channel, because as you subscribe to the channel, these things become more prevalent. They, they, they rise to the top, so to speak. And that gives these people more exposure, more people understand what's going on. And, fr- and from the people that are sitting there sharing their stories, that's going out to somebody that you may know. So this is where we ask you to help. So if you share our videos with other folks, hit that like button, that subscribe, and that notification. It's going to go a long way to do what we would like to do here. So, Buddy, I think uh, for me, that's about all the questions I have. Thank you very much. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you for taking your time and being here and uh, sharing your story. I I got quite a bit out of it, too. So now I got some research to do, all right? Well, folks, until next time, uh, next podcast, uh, this is Hank, John. We appreciate you being here, and uh, put the word out for us, all right? Thank you much.